Martijn Graaf en this is Does Logistics Matter, a podcast about trends and innovations in supply chain and logistics. Answering yes to the question today is David Lynch. David is Senior Vice President Analytical Solutions and Services at Sayari, the leading risk intelligence platform. In this episode, we talk about supply chain risks, what companies can do to mitigate them, the importance of data and visibility, and why you should leverage and unlock the power of public data. Please enjoy my conversation with David Lynch. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, David, the, the first question in this podcast is always the same, and that question is, does logistics matter? And a, a resounding yes. It's it's probably the, the most important thing that we don't talk enough about. Um, we were... We were actually at an, at an event a couple of weeks ago uh, with some of my colleagues, and the keynote kind of made, a, I think, a pretty poignant comment about logistics is the most important thing that you never think about. It's like oxygen. Yeah. It's You don't realize it. You don't think about it until it's not there. Until it's not there, yes. And then and, everybody's uh, screaming for it. You know, and I think, you know, as a as an entirety, I think we all had that, you know, where's the oxygen, where's the logistics moment uh, you know, about three and a half years ago with, with COVID, and it really thrust it to the, to the forefront of all of our minds. Um, so, you know, probably not a shocker on this podcast, but yes, uh, logistics and supply chain absolutely matter. It's, uh, it, it literally makes the world go round. Yep. Good. That's, I, you know, I like that answer. Yeah. Um, uh, nobody has said no yet. Uh, uh, at <laughs> least, at least, I mean, <laughs> people have said no, but they were definitely not on this podcast. So, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> okay. So, so how, how did you, uh, how did you, uh, end up working in, in this industry? Yeah. You know, it, it has not been a, a direct path and I think I'm, it's safe to say that I sort of tripped and, and fell into it <laughs> about three and a half years ago. I will say though, you know, you know, I'm not a, a logistician or a, a you know a, a supply chain you know trade compliance practitioner by trade, but for the past ten years, I've been looking at uh, transnational global criminal networks, right? Multi-billion, hundred billion dollar criminal enterprises that it turns out rely on very similar systems of commerce and trade that our trillion dollar you know commercial sector um, re- come to rely on. Right? Yeah. How do we get goods moving from point A to point B? How do we you know, make financial transactions to facilitate those those trades? And you know, admittedly, I think like a lot of people, I sort of got thrust into the the logistics and the supply chain space, you know, in in kind of the the late winter, early spring of of 2020 with COVID, mm-hmm. when when logistic systems started to fail, and it, it does turn out that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the techniques and, and practices of of understanding, you know, criminal trade flows and, and and criminal logistics networks have a lot of applicability to just understanding broader, you know, supply chains and, and trade activity. And you know that that overlap really comes to to bear when when you think about the vulnerabilities that that might exist in a supply chain or or in logistics networks. And so, you know, for myself and yeah, you know, a lot of my colleagues, that that's kind of the the uh, unintentional route that we all landed in this logistics and, and supply chain space. Yeah, yeah. And I I recently spoke to a uh, to a to a security ex- expert um, on uh, logistics flows. So, and this was a uh, this was a gentleman specialized in uh, how to um, make. Um, logistics buildings more secure, uh, but also you know when goods are moving from A to B. So what's important when there's a when there's a, a truck, and how do you make sure the truck's safe and secure? And and what he mentioned, and I and I thought, yeah, he's he's definitely right. He, uh, there there is a some there is a, an unfair advantage, right, between the criminal elements and um, and uh, law abiding. Uh, companies, because the criminal elements uh, do do not have to play by the rules, so it's a bit of an un, bit of an unfair fight. That's absolutely right. Um, almost almost by design, they don't play by the rules. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it but it turns out, you know, both both criminal networks and uh, entirely legitimate commercial enterprises 
rely on these same systems of of commerce and trade and yeah um you know from from that perspective there there's a lot of overlap between the two so so the the so this this uh, risk of 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 uh you know uh criminal interference with with supply chains is that uh the is that the only risk that you that you look at oh absolutely not uh it, it's an important one but yeah unfortunately the the risk environment is is quite large um it certainly makes the job of uh, trade compliance specialists and, and logisticians all that more difficult because this isn't just a matter of you know screening your supply chain or or your logi- or your logistics networks for a, a single type of of threat or issue right this can be everything from you know organized crime like we've sort of been talking about for the past few minutes but it yeah. can also be issues like forced labor or slave labor right yeah are, is there unintentional expose or unintended ex- exposure in our supply chains to to forced or slave labor? It could be export control violations, right? Are we are we inadvertently linking ourselves to uh, you, know, you know elements that are, are that that we don't want to be associated with? So yeah, there's there's a pretty wide swath of, of risk that you know unfortunately the, the private sector is is. Is responsible for screening against. So, what are ways in in which they uh, uh, can get a, a a grip on these risks? Yeah, you know, it's. You might hear me say this a couple times today. I, I am a, a huge advocate for leaning on public data. Okay. Yeah. It it it, it turns out that you know. There is there is, uh, actually, break hell. Sure. <clears throat> so that's a great question. You know, and it, you know, you'll hear me kind of say this a couple times probably throughout this podcast, but you know, I am I am a huge proponent of public data. Yes. And and specifically leveraging that public data to to get better visibility into the types of risks that we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, really beginning about, you know, a decade and a half ago, if not a little bit more. There's just been this explosion, this this massive proliferation of what can be seen with public data. Right, this is everything from trade flows to to understanding the actual commercial entities that are kind of located at every single tier of your supply chain or or node of your logistics network. Yeah, um, and so you know, leaning on this public data is is super important. We are kind of the train has left the station in terms of um, more and more things becoming public and more and more things going online. You know, there's uh, it's almost kind of antithetical to think that if we really want to understand a a global supply chain, well, then we're only going to rely on secret or or proprietary data. The world's too big. The the supply chains are, are, are too vast for us to to only rely on that. And so the great thing about public data is, is in the name itself. It's public. Yeah. Right. You and I can access this data, right? Everyone listening to this podcast can access this data. It's out there. Now, admittedly, just because it's out there doesn't mean it's, it's necessarily easy to access. There there might be language barriers or, or data structure barriers, but it's fundamentally public in there. And, you know, I, I think, we'd all be better off sort of leveraging that, that public data to, to get better visibility into our, our supply chain and risk. So, so can you, uh, can you paint me a picture of a, uh, of a, of a, of an internationally operating company with an international supply chain and how, uh, you know, and give some examples on how, uh, public data can, can mitigate s- certain risks that they might face. Sure. Yeah, I think the, the scenario that I'll kind of paint here is, probably pretty cross cutting across you know most commercial sectors and that is yeah. right everyone has their tier 1 suppliers right the 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 list of companies or individuals that they rely on yeah. to receive goods directly but the value chain doesn't start there right the no. people that we're importing from probably imported from someone else and yeah. they probably imported from someone else beyond that um and you know so let's say we're Let's say we're a Dutch company, and we're we're importing from a company in Germany, mm-hmm. 
and that German company is importing from from China. Yes. Okay, so it's a relatively simple trade flow, but it's it's multi hop. Yeah. Right. This Dutch company needs to understand, you know, the trade flow from Germany to to itself. It needs to understand the the German entity that it's directly transacting with. Yeah, te technically, uh, te technically, uh, in this in this uh, uh, example, the United Kingdom is a slightly uh, better example because they left the, the European Union and Germany is within the European Union, so it's 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 uh, actually really easy to uh, uh, to move goods between <laughs> Germany and and uh, and the Netherlands. Yeah, but I think you know the the sort of the pursuit of of understanding the end the end customers. In your trading partners and the actual trade flows, yeah, is, is almost geography ag agnostic. You know, that, sure, that's, that's definitely true. Trade flows between, you know, the Netherlands and, and Germany are easier than say the Netherlands and the UK, but there's still a requirement to understand the counterparty that you're directly trading with. That's true. And then who they're sourcing from, and so yeah, we we can pivot to the to a UK example, but you know, the Dutch company can use public records to understand. Who owns and controls that UK company? It can use public records to actually see the trade flow between that UK company and itself. Mm -hmm. It can use those exact same public records to see the trade flow between the UK entity and its supplier in China. So, it's, what are some of the sources that that uh, that, that they then can use? Yeah. So, th this is mostly government published data. Okay. You know, yep. most most countries will have um, a variety of official public registries. Mm -hmm. Most commonly, this this might be a, a corporate registry, right? Yeah. Where, like where a, companies like a need to chamber of commerce. Exactly. Um, where you need to register your company, you need to tell us who owns it, who controls it, and, and various other attributes about the company. Yeah. Right? Those details might might actually lend some visibility into into risk. Um, but it's not just it's not not just corporate registries. It's also tax registries, procurement filing registries, um, you know, chambers of commerce, like you said, and then also trade data. So obviously, things like corporate registries or tax registries are are great for understanding the the corporate entities in your in your logistics networks mm -hmm. or your supply chain. But if you want to actually see the the, the commercial trade activity happening between those entities, you need trade records. You need, yeah. you need bills of lading. Yeah. And like corporate registries, it, it turns out that a lot of these registries are accessible mm -hmm. and are public. And so, you know, we could then use these public records to then understand what our UK company is sourcing from China. Yeah. And if that Chinese company that it's sourcing from might present some kind of hidden or non-obvious risk to our supply chain and our logistics networks. Yeah, for for example, by using parts that were created by uh, by forced labor, or or by using parts from a country that's uh, like the using like a, a a part from North Korea, for example, which which you know, which is not allowed uh, as well. It's things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and. You know, one thing you just kind of made me think of this is a lot of times the risk will sit not in your immediate supplier, but mm -hmm. a, a tier beyond. And it's like, it's yeah. hard to get that visibility. You know, you know, you can have, you can have, you know, sympathy for the, the Dutch company in our, in our scenario here mm -hmm. where, you know, they, they might understand that UK supplier really well, Yeah, but do they even know to look? To the Chinese data to see if there's connections. Yeah, you know, and, and the answer is often no. It's and so, um, you, you know, the the point you made me think of here was the the risk that we face from things like forced labor or export controls or yeah or sanctions. Sure, there are, there are lists out there. There are there are public lists that we can reference. But the scary thing is that those lists are oftentimes only the tip of the iceberg of the actual threat or the, or the actual risk. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it really is, you know, extremely important for 
those involved in logistics and in the supply chain space to to know how to look beyond that tier one yeah so that they can surface that that potentially well certainly not obvious but still pretty damning risk yeah so um uh yeah, my, so I, then I guess my next question is: so how how would that work? Because it's uh, it's a lot of work to access a lot of data, uh, well, well, databases. You know, to, to access all the data, that's a lot of work. You need to know where it is. You need to uh, get it into your own systems. You have to do some kind of analysis or calculation or co- a comparison. And if I know one thing about uh, logistics, even if it's just two companies working together trying to ship something from A to B. Um, no, as you know, the, nobody has the same data. Nobody, and, and, uh, I'm exaggerating a, a little bit, but you know, everybody calls everything something else. You know, it's it's not a the problem that we face here is not a problem of of, of there being enough data. Right? There's, there's frankly too much data sometimes. Yeah. It seems, uh, and even you know, I'm kind of neck deep in the data world day in day out, and even sometimes I kind of think that too. Uh, the, the real the real challenge here is which data is important mm-hmm. and, and how do I find it? How do I access it? Um, you know, when we think about our, our supply chains and our, in our logistics networks, mm-hmm. uh, what makes this even more complicated is right. We're not just looking at, we're not just trying to find out, you know, risk from ownership control and trade for a single entity. We're oftentimes doing it for hundreds or thousands of entities. Yeah, and to make the problem even uh, even more severe is that it, it's also not just the risk that those hundreds or or thousands of direct suppliers carry. It's it's the entire upstream risk that that those direct suppliers yeah expose you to. You know, there's which which makes this a problem of scale. How yeah. do we how do we take the the very manageable process of, of vetting a single company and its trade flows and kind of automate that process so that we can do it for a thousand suppliers. Um, you know, I, I'm certainly of the mind that this is, this is not an issue that can be solved with, with bodies, right? We can't, we can't throw, no. you know, a hundred or a thousand. Let me just, uh, let me just uh, put that in my Excel sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I yeah. might need a, I might need a pivot table here. <laughs> uh, yeah, we. You know, I think our, people are our, trying. They right? are trying. Still, and still. The, <laughs> I think with, with the number of pivot tables we would need, it might crash all of our computers. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and so, you know, th- there needs to be some automation with this. Yes. You know, so that so that we can focus on the risk that truly matters. Yeah. You know, I. I think it's probably safe to say that for you know, uh, good practitioners of, of supply chain trade compliance and, and, and logistics due diligence, you know, their, their direct supplier network is, you know, probably okay. Um, but can we, can we take the thousands of things we have to look at and, and quickly triage to the, you know, the few percent that actually carry the risk that, has the potential to really undermine our supply chain and our, and our logistics resiliency. Um, so, you know, we could happy to dive deep more on that, but you know, automation is key here so that we can, yeah, yeah, we can yeah. really focus on the, on the, the most severe risk. And it, and it's, and it's a good thing that the, the, the whole uh, quality of uh, uh, automation is, uh, you know, well, I, I, I guess exploding as fast as, uh, as you know, the, 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 the speed of uh, processors has, uh, has exploded. Uh, the, the power of algorithms has, uh, it, it keeps growing, I guess. Yeah. I, you know, I think, um, th- this is certainly like the process of automating this is, is not beyond reach for for industry. Um, there, there's a lot of ways to do this at scale, relatively inexpensively, relatively, you know, easily easily onboarded. Um, doesn't make the challenge easier, but there's I think the there, there are just there are plenty of of uh, of ways that we can do this. 
Yeah. So now, so so I'm guessing. So we're talking about uh, algorithms, and then you know, uh, well, especially nowadays, pretty pretty soon, you know, it's the the word AI uh, comes around the corner. So uh, I'm I'm guessing this this is not one of those hey. Chat GPT, what's my biggest supply chain risk uh, kind of thing? So it's 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 more complex than that. So uh, can you can you explain a little bit more about how it works? Yeah, I can. Although I I, I, I will say I've not posed that question to Chat GPT. I might try that after this podcast and see what it, see what it says. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, taking taking a bridge from our on our points on automation. Yeah, AI plays a role here for sure. Um, you know, at, at the risk of uh, maybe alienating myself from some of my colleagues, though, I don't want to. I'm not one to sort of quickly hop on 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 the AI bandwagon here, because if we don't have the right data underpinning, you know, the AI models, yes. You know, I, th- I think we're only going to have marginal impacts. Uh, but this is the reason that I bring it up because what I, what 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 I find when I talk to people in in, in supply chain and logistics that that um, uh, are, are not so much aware of you know the technology and how it works, they 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 do believe that when somebody says AI, it's like oh they it's like a chat GPT t- type thing. But uh, you know that's. That's a large language model, but it's that's that's you know there's there's different types of AI. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, we're we're not at a state uh, in, as an industry, uh, as as practitioners, where there's a there's an easy button here with AI to say you know yeah. show me the risk. Yeah. Um, and then you know we can dust our hands of it, and and you know we can kind of carry on with our with our days. Um, I think where where AI can be helpful, though, is in, and this is kind of kind of going back to our earlier discussion of it, it can be helpful at at sifting through what actually matters. Yeah. Um, so that you know, as as a as a trade compliance analyst, as as a when you're conducting due diligence on your logistics networks, that you don't need to sift through ten thousand yeah. companies. You you can focus on the the hundred that that present true risk to you, and you know that's a certainly a much more manageable, almost yeah. bite size problem compared to the, the the initial list of tens of thousands. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you you so it it gives you the uh, the opportunity to spend your time, um, uh, yeah, looking at the the one risk instead of the the ten thousand potential risks. Uh, uh, David, can, can you give us some more examples uh, about how uh, AI can uh, help companies identify risks? Absolutely. I'll, I'll look at. I'll, I'll use trade flows a, as a good example here. Yeah. And, and let's actually take it back to that you know initial Dutch company example yeah. who supplies from the UK, who then connects You're to from China. China. Yeah. So, let's imagine that we're uh, you know a semiconductor company. In, in the Netherlands, and yep. where we are sourcing, um, you know, integrated circuits from the UK. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, but let's say though that 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 UK company is sourcing tennis balls from China. Yeah. Sure. There is a connection between this Dutch company through the UK to China. Yeah. But is it a connection that actually matters? Probably not, right? No. Tennis balls aren't a, aren't part of, or a component of of integrated circuits, and no. therefore, like, there's kind of a break in the supply chain. Yeah. So I think you know a place where AI can can really help here is helping us at scale understand the the, the component parts that go into um, you know finished products or mm-hmm. or key product parts. So you know. And let's also not imagine just a single trade flow, because that's not very realistic. But I think a lot of your listeners, right, might be in, in a space where they're they're trying to tackle and, and get visibility on hundreds of thousands of trade flows, yeah, 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 or, or, or millions. And so, you know, for for us, you know, AI has been super impactful in terms of helping us identify 
meaningful like product component workflows in a supply chain. Because like that example we painted, because it's tennis balls and, and integrated circuits, it's a yep. mismatch. It's a mismatch. But but what if what if that Chinese company was was actually supplying um, like fuses or switchboards? Yeah, which are component parts to uh, you know to to integrated circuits. Yep, that's a connection that actually matters. So one thing we've been doing is taking a look at frankly, hundreds of millions of trade transactions mm -hmm. to look at the, the sort of the product and product component workflow, analyzing what components go into a specific type of product so that you can, again, sift through all the noise of, of mismatched supply chains mm -hmm. and, and only focus on the, the actual value add component to product to, uh, to delivery supply chains that let you spot risk. Because again, if we're, if we're the, the raw data might, might expose all this, you know, forced labor exposure, mm -hmm. might, might expose you to all this forced labor risk in China. But if we're dealing with a component part in a product mismatch, the risk actually isn't there. So if we can spot those component parts, that actually lets us focus on, on the true risk. And so, you know, we're using AI to, to sift through hundreds of millions, billions of trade transactions to essentially build these product blueprints, right? Yeah. Telling us what actual components are used for any given product. And all this goes back to public data. And, you know, sort of this is sort of the, you know, the, these AI models are, are only as good as the, the data we we put into them. Yes. And, you know, I think there's, there's a couple of advantages to, to using public data. One, everyone has access, right? So yeah. you can, industry can kind of work off a, a, a you know, a, a common uh, sheet of music for, for data. Yep. And, and the second thing is provenance, right? Where did this come from? Yeah. Can I, can I, if something is, is popping with risk? Can I can I dive deep and interrogate that? Um, and I think that's important. I think for you know, just by itself. But you know, when there's especially with AI, when there's questions around how did we get to the to, how did we get to the end result here, mm -hmm. the the ability to dive deep onto those you know official public records is pretty important to make sure that not only we're spotting the risk, but that we can then dive deep on the risk when when we want to. So, so is there also um, is there also uh, a cleaning or uh, maybe even enriching uh, data? Yeah, you know this. It is a messy data problem. Yeah, you know, um, again, just because something's public does not mean it's easy to access. You know, there's there's language barriers. You know, I myself don't speak Chinese. No, <laughs> <laughs> how do I access? how do I access Chinese corporate records or procurement data or trade records? Yeah. I don't speak most languages, right? So how do I, how do I, you know, access those, those databases that are oftentimes or who oftentimes are kind of the disclosure languages in the language of that country. Yep. Um, and you know, that, that's a, a tricky, that's a tricky problem set for a single country. Mm -hmm. it, it does become even more challenging when, when you want to then apply that across the globe because, you know, our, our supply chains don't expose us to one country. They expose us to most countries. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, when you look at that true upstream supply chain. Um, so it's not just doing this in one country. It's, it's stitching it together cross border, right? You know, everyone listening to this podcast today, like their, their supply chains are, are cross border, are, are multinational and they're complex. Yeah. How do you, how do you follow the dots? How do you follow the, the relationships, the trade transactions, the ownership structures when mm -hmm. they do go cross border? And so, you know, for this to work, yeah, there, there's got to be, you know, frankly, a lot of that unsexy data cleaning, data structuring, data normalizing mm -hmm. that lets us kind of put the put the pedal to the metal in terms of leveraging this public data and, and, and 
spotting that non-obvious risk. Yeah, and also making 100% sure we're comparing apples to apples, right? I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, so you uh, you've mentioned uh, so you mentioned several risks, uh, also several ways how uh, how data can be be leveraged to 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 mitigate these risks. Now for uh, for companies with global complex supply chains with with thousands of uh, or maybe tens of thousands of trade flows and different products and parts and uh, who want to mitigate risk who want to look beyond uh, tier one suppliers um, what steps can these companies take to uh, get a better grip on their um, uh, supply chain risk that's uh, that's a really good question you know, we, we've laid out the problem but uh, what's the solution yeah, you, you know, a couple things come to mind here. You know, first, it's it's making sure that the the company has an understanding of what the risk profile that they're screening for actually is. Yeah, and we've touched a little bit on this, right? You know, this when when you're looking at your logistics networks and your supply chain, this is not just a matter of looking against a list. What other kinds of risk are you looking for? in your in your logistics and your and your supply chain. Yeah. Right? This could this could include transshipment risk, right? This kind of goes back to our, our indirect trade exposure yeah, yeah. points. This this takes into account uh, geographic risk, ownership and control risk. You know, sure we can use those those lists, those public sanctions lists as a starting point. Mm -hmm. But Again, the true risk here is, is in the is in the network effect of these lists, right? What do those sanction entities actually own? Who do they conduct trade with? You know, are there subsidiaries that, that we might inadvertently be doing business with whose whose parent company is, you know, on the UFLPA list or or is sanctioned? So, d defining a a kind of a coherent risk screen structure is is important. Right. Um, secondly, is obviously the data. Um, you know, you you can define risk, in, you know, perfectly. But if you don't, if you then don't have the data to actually answer that question, with it's, it's what's the point? It's, it's yeah. then just sort of an academic exercise. Um, public data, right? This is, but kind of stressing the earlier points here. You know, it's not like the it's not like the United Nations has a single registry for all for for the entire world where it's like, hey, here's here's every single company on the planet, here's every single trade transaction, here you go. Well, it would be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> not a bad idea. <laughs> but the but the challenge here is you have to build access. Yeah. Right? You know, and this is not easy, right? This is it, it takes it takes years and you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of hours to to collect and structure this data. And again, you don't just have to, unfortunately, we can't just do it once. You then have to perpetually refresh it. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is, when it, when it comes to issues like corporate ownership or, uh, you know, commercial trade, mm -hmm. obviously this is not static, right? It changes. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, it's not like the Twitter fire hose or the X fire hose, where if, if you look away for a second, then you've missed the world. But it's still dynamic. No, it's right? yeah. A company might have a certain ownership ownership structure today, but a month from now it might be different. And, and suddenly it's a problem because now it's owned by somebody that uh, is on a sanctioned list. So the so. that's right. And then it's even more dynamic when you look at the trade activity, right? You know. Today, there's been a set, there, there's been a sort of a, a defined set of historical trade transactions. But if we look forward a month, there might be another 1,500 or 5,000 trade transactions that we need to make sure that we're comfortable with and we've got yep. visibility on. So the challenge here is, is not only collecting the data in the first place, but refreshing it in such a way that you have that kind of near real-time visibility. Yeah. Most companies, unfortunately, don't have the resources to do this. You know, you could you could invest and in, in build entire teams to to start this, but um, you know, our, our recommendation, you know, 
and, and this is why we this is why we as a company exist. This is why we we work with um, you know folks like those listening to this podcast is you know helping them gain access to this data by by giving them software and giving them tools that that allow them to kind of perpetually access and 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 query this data, which is you know super complex and messy and you know it's about kind of providing that clean interface. Um, with, with a very low so so, so you are the link between the uh, between their uh, their own supply chain systems then their their data and this 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 large quantity of of uh, uh, public data out there that's right you Co know commercial it's, commercial data as well yeah so you know for us it, it's it's all about publicly available data. Now th this could include commercially publicly available data, right? Some of, some ah, of this data. So, okay. It's just, it, it's public, publicly available data, but some data you need to, uh, you need to pay something to get it, but it's still publicly available. That's, that's the, which, okay, clear. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, you know, and for, for us and, you know, I, I, I think for, for your listeners, right, there's, a, there's a pretty f clean or, or firm line in the sand between proprietary and secret data yes. versus publicly or commercially available data. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is where I'm, I'm firmly in, in, the, in the camp of the, the, the foundation of, of improved sort of supply chain transparency and, and understanding your logistics networks. The, the foundation sits in public data, right? Because it's that common operating picture that, that, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can lean on it, you can reference it, and you can rely on it. And sure, you can then always supplement that with, with your own personal you know, company proprietary data, but that, that foundation is key. Okay, so, um, so if, I, if I recap what you're saying, uh, companies need to be clear on the dangers that they want to look for. Uh, maybe they make certain claims like our product is uh, is 100% uh, ecological. Then then that needs to be tracked, and they need to check all these public uh, databases to make sure that all the things that go into that product are ecological, or that that doesn't they they don't contain this, or there's nothing that comes from that country. So they need to have that uh, in order. They have to have their own data in order. And, and then what you're saying, the next step is to, um, uh, to, to use a, a platform like yours to um, connect their own data to the public data, to have powerful algorithms identify the, the true risks that they absolutely need to focus on. That's exactly right. And you know, I think to maybe echo on your first recap point there, you know, what a what a what a semiconductor company might care about, yeah, is going to be different than what an apparel company might care about. Yes, you know, and there's you know we um, we do live in a complex regulatory environment, right? There's whether it's export controls or import control. There's a lot. To, yes, there's a lot to worry about. Um, I you know I think um, you know we we are though at a unique point in history. I think where the our, our regulatory obligations are are getting closer and closer to our our, our moral obligations. You know, all, all the forced labor regulation, in particular, kind of makes me think that. Yes. Where you know, there's the the, the moral obligation to make sure that there isn't forced labor in our supply chain happens to be pretty well aligned with the, the current regulatory frameworks that yeah. also prohibit such exposure. Yes. Well, and that's why I mentioned ecological because it's a uh, because th that's one of those things that uh, that that it's just a choice for the company. It's out of their own choice, out of their own choosing that they that they uh, that that's a risk for them. And then you have all the regulatory things, and those are yeah, more or less the same for everybody. So there's so there's a really really powerful and innovative ways uh, for for companies to uh, get a, a a stronger grip on on their supply chain risk what's left or maybe a better question what's in the future are there certain technologies that you see or 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 other things that uh, uh you know that are maybe on or just behind the horizon um uh, that could impact this yeah a couple things come to mind 
and I'll, I'll touch on a couple different issues, some of which are, are in our control and some of which are yeah, not. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, firstly, we've all witnessed a, a pretty rapid expansion in the, in the regulatory environment over the past couple of years yep. on both sort of, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, um, you know, import controls with forced labor, but also, you know, export controls driven by, you know, geopolitical issues. I think that's going to continue. Right. And so that the, there mm -hmm. will be, we all feel pressure now to make sure that, you know, there's, 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 um, kind of, that we understand the, the the risk environment that we're operating in, that expectation that and that pressure though is, is only going to increase. So that's yeah. going to be one, I think, fairly easy uh, prediction to make. Um, the second though, which will help us uh, respond to the, these increasing uh, regulatory pressures, is that there's also a, a a frankly great trend of 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 digitization and making more things public. Yeah. Um, more and more countries are, are digitizing their public records. They're making them available. Um, whereas they weren't before. And I, you know, I won't call out any countries in particular on this, but you know, there's even looking back over the past 10 years, you know, dozens of countries who previously only had, you know, paper record keeping now have, digitize their corporate registries yeah. and their tax registries, which allows us as industry to kind of use that data to answer some of the questions we've been talking about. Now, I think that the third thing that, you know, I'm anticipating is, again, in part driven by regulatory pressures, but in, in you know, the expectation is that we're no, no longer just looking at tier one suppliers or, or that, that, that first tier of the, of the logistics network, but the expectation will be that you have visibility into tier two, three, right? That, that upstream supply chain that yeah. you know, where the risk actually is. And so uh, we've certainly witnessed that a lot in talking with, you know, our, our, you know, private sector partners where they are changing their posture going from a, Oh yeah, my my direct suppliers are, you know, are a okay. Let's move on. Good to go. To to a posture in which they are accepting that that is not enough, and that they are kicking off sort of second order, third order investigations into those tier two, tier three, tier four upstream yeah. suppliers. Yeah, I guess across the board, uh, whether you're talking about uh, 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 regulatory uh, uh, regulatory bodies or 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 just you know uh, customers, um, they, everybody's getting more demanding as well. So they want to know they want to know more about what you're doing. They want to know more about where things come from. So uh, it's a, it's a, uh, that that that's increasing as well. It is, um, and. At the risk of maybe sounding like a broken record, this is why public data is so important, right? You know, the demands are increasing. The, the questions that we're all forced to ask are increasing. What if we could? What if we could lean on public data to answer those questions for us? And, and the answer is we can, but we can only do that if we have the the kind of the architecture in place to access, to access that public data. And this is, you know, again, not an easy feat, but, you know, through automation, by, by leaning on, on tools to support your, your current staff that's, you know, looking at the upstream supply chain, conducting due diligence on your logistics networks, it's achievable. It really is. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent end note, uh, David. Um, thank you so much for uh, for uh, sharing your your uh, well, your knowledge on uh, on supply chain risks, uh, data, uh, how to m mitigate uh, uh, that uh, risk, um, and uh, well, if one thing is not clear for everybody, uh, the importance of public data. Our team, thank you very much for for having me today, and and um, even more so for for having this podcast. It's uh, it's an, an extremely important issue, and and. Uh, I'll, I'll close out on my side by echoing your initial question. Uh, logistics does matter. So thank you for, for being a voice for that. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to Does Logistics Matter? For more on trends and innovation in supply chain and logistics, visit our blog at logisticsmatter.com. If you want to be a guest on this podcast, please send an email to podcast at logisticsmatter.com. This podcast was produced by Dimitri Vleugel. The music is based on a sample by Rockerman and produced by Michael Spengler. This episode was powered by Sayari, the leading risk intelligence platform trusted by government agencies, multinational corporations and financial institutions. Its intuitive platform services hidden risk through integrated corporate ownership, supply chain, trade transaction and risk intelligence data. For more information, visit sayari.com. That's S-A-Y-A-R-I.com.